Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to the Hindu News Super Analysis for today. Before we begin, an important reminder. 14th of December, that is tomorrow, we have a very very important workshop for you all live on the Baiju's Exam Prep app where we will be discussing the best way to choose an optional subject for the UPSC examination. Don't forget to attend this workshop. The link to register for this workshop is given in the description of the video. Make sure that you click on that and register and attend the workshop tomorrow, 7 p.m. live. Now, let's begin with the very first article that is focusing on the issue of public health. Now, before we go any further, I would just like to clarify. There is a lot of confusion in the minds of people and they often get mixed up between public health and the public health care sector in India. These are two very different things. What is public health? Public health basically means what should be the policies of the government to tackle the issues which are actually impacting large number of people across the country. Let me give you an example. So the government of India has a responsibility of ensuring that polio vaccination, for example, reaches everyone or COVID vaccination reaches everyone or issues such as, let's say, malnutrition. These are the issues that impact everyone. So what policies to be made on that front? How the government can actually fight against them? What kind of policy should be made for vaccination coverage? What kind of guidelines should be given to fight against malnutrition, etc.? That comes under the definition of public health, meaning that dealing with issues that actually impact large number of population and that would have an overall impact. Public sector healthcare, on the other hand, means government hospitals that deal with patients individually. Now, let's come back to the article. The author here says that Indian government has not really worked well in the area of public health. We often give preference to individualism. Now, what is individualism? As the name suggests, individualism means treating individual patients one by one, treating individual people one by one, those who have a problem. Yes, that is also an important part of healthcare, but that is not what public health is all about. Public health means the government policies should impact a larger population. And rather than dealing one by one people, we should rather focus on policies which are mainly aimed at those people who need it the most. The author here says, we have failed to examine and interpret public health problems on a large scale in India. That is why most of our vaccination programs have not been very successful. Yes, the COVID-19 vaccination program has rolled out to be a success. But even that could have been much, much better. The author here says that we are actually, in our approach, more focused on individuals, on each and everyone, which is not really the aim of public health. Public health means we should focus on that population, which is first of all, under a lot of danger. And only then, after that population is tackled, we should go at other populations. For example, even when the COVID-19 vaccine was rolled out, we should first have focused on those people only which have the need for vaccine immediately. Only after that, we should have actually moved on to the other people as well. He gives multiple examples. For example, he says, look at the Ayushman Bharat Yojana that provides free of cost medical health insurance and covers all kinds of hospitalization services. Now, this actually gives an assurance to the people that you would not have to incur any expenditure on hospitalization, which is a good thing. But the reality is something other than this. He says that on an average, about 3% of total population of India had an episode of hospitalization in an entire year. So it is that population that has to be focused first rather than giving everyone a cover, which is not really the case. He says that ideally, Government needs to focus its healthcare facilities on that 3 to 5 percent population cover that requires hospitalization. That is what public health is all about. Focusing on those people, prioritizing those people who need the government's help the most, and then moving on to the other people. This approach to vaccination for COVID 19 also should have been different. We should have first focused on those people who require it the most, those who are at the biggest threat of hospitalization, and then we should have moved on to the other people after that. Also, the problem is that we don't really talk a lot about the healthcare infrastructure in India. Yes, ever since the COVID-19 pandemic hit, there has been a lot of debate on the need for having more expenditure on the government trying to spend more money in public health. But the reality is, even after that, there is not a lot of debate when it comes to healthcare in India. 
most of the deaths in COVID-19 were mainly due to the ventilators not being offered to the people and ICUs not being available in the second wave as all of you would remember. The government of India should actually have a profile of those people who are at a higher risk and those should be targeted first with our policies. That is the entire goal of public health as per the person who has written this article. He says that there are three reasons why this is not happening. Three reasons why public health is not at the forefront and we are dealing with individual cases much better. First, misconception that healthcare at individual level is the same as public health which is not the case. Just because we have good doctors who are being able to ensure that individual cases are dealt with properly doesn't mean that public health will also be the same. Public health requires different types of studies, different types of expertise, different types of policy making and we should not forget that. Second reason he says, health effects are more visible and appear convincing at an individual scale. So when an, at an individual level we see that these many people have been infected or these are the symptoms, it impacts the policy makers more. That should not be the case. Third, the role of the market. See, at the end of the day, healthcare is a big, big business in any country whatsoever. There are companies worth billions and billions of dollars that are in the field of pharmaceutical. For them, it is always preferable if the government says that we are launching a policy for everyone. For example, free healthcare for everyone, free hospitalization for everyone. They would want everyone to be covered. While the government's priority should be rather than covering everyone, we should cover that population first that is in the need of the government support. That is why the interference of these private sector companies also has a big, big role to play because they would want all the people to be covered, all the people to be targeted, while the government's responsibility is to target those people first in public health, which are at a greater risk. All these have to be changed in the long run. Now, there have been multiple articles written on public health topic ever since the corona pandemic has become a part of our lives. There have been multiple issues raised about what are the problems with public health in India. Let me revise with you a few of the issues mainly with public health in India. First, poor understanding. The word public health itself is not very easy to understand for most of the people. As I said in the beginning, many people confuse between public health and public health care sector. These are two entirely different things. Public health sector is the government hospitals, the government doctors, while public health is government's policy making to tackle health issues and to target that population first, which is at a greater risk. Lack of specific competencies. See, public health in itself is a different field altogether. Usually we see whenever the government appoints medical experts or medical advisors who would advise to the government on health policies, they are usually top surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, cardiac surgeons, etc. Yes, they are very good doctors. They can deal with individual cases brilliantly. But again, the problem is they are not the same as public health experts. Public health experts are very different and they actually have to be very much experts in policy making about health. That's a different field altogether, but we have not understood that. Third, the qualification related issues. As I said, public health as a subject in college has not been focused upon. And you can look at it from economics point of view as well. See, people who pursue medicine, they also know that if they actually want to make a lot of money in the future, that lucrative career option is not in public health. That is when you actually take a field such as cardiac surgery, etc. So there are not many people opting for public health discipline as a whole, which is where the government has to come in and encourage these people to take up these disciplines as well. Then there are other challenges as well. The mindless section of the society still does not have access to good health care. Lack of robust public health infrastructure, hospitals, lack of doctors. In a country of India's size, the proportion of doctors that we have are still nowhere near adequate. So all these things have to be tackled in the long run. The government of India in 2017, as you can see, released the national health policy. These are the important pointers of the national health policy, where the government talked about ensuring affordable primary health care, giving multiple choices to people. For example, they can go for allopathic treatment, IUSH, etc. Using technology with the help of telecommunication, teleeducation, consultation, etc. Also focusing on patients ensuring that good quality care is given to them in the long run. 
The next article that we have here is on a topic of importance for not just India but the entire world. That is the big tech. Now, big tech usually refers to those tech companies which are ruling the entire world together. Google, Amazon, Meta, which you actually call Facebook, Twitter. These are the companies which are usually considered as the big tech. You can add Microsoft also in this. Now, around the world, the nations are realizing the fact that these companies have become so big that they have now made a monopoly in the market and they are making it impossible for any competition to exist. For example, Google has such regulations in place, they have such provisions in place that it is almost impossible for any new entrepreneur to think that they will also make a search engine and coexist with Google because Google will make such kind of policy that it will become almost impossible for anyone to compete with them. Same is a problem with Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, etc. Nations around the world are trying to tackle this problem by making changes in the law and India is also doing the same. The reason why it was in the news in India was in October, the Competition Commission of India, CCI, which has a responsibility of ensuring that monopolies are not misused in India. They impose a penalty of 1,337 crores on Google for abusing their dominant position in Android mobile device ecosystem. Now, as you know, mobiles across the entire world mainly only use two operating systems. If it's an Apple mobile, then they'll use the iOS. Other mobiles will use the Android. Now, Android is a product of Google. Meaning that crores and crores of mobile phones across the world are running on a platform that is owned by Google only. That gives them a very, very dominant position to actually decide what will run on their Android platform and what will not run on their Android platform. For example, Google has made such provisions that apart from Google search, almost no other search would work well when it is uploaded on the Android mobile system. That is just one example of how big tech is misusing its dominant position. While India does not have robust laws to deal with it, there are nations around the world, for example, USA, Australia, even the European Union, they have made changes to their law to tackle these kind of issues. And this penalty being put on Google in India is not the first case like this. These nations have already put huge penalties on Google and Amazon for misusing their position. The Competition Commission of India, while putting this penalty, said, that the intent of Google's business was to make the users on its platforms abide by its own revenue earning service, which is the online search. As you know, Google earns most of its revenue from the online search that we do while they display ads, etc. This is where Google does not want any competition whatsoever. These companies also refer to the idea of predatory pricing. Predatory pricing means whenever a new company comes in, these old companies, because they have a lot of money, they reduce their prices drastically so that the new company cannot compete with them. And once the new company goes out of business, they will again increase their prices. This is called predatory pricing. These are some of the things which Amazon, Flipkart, etc. have all been accused of because they are so big and large. They are so much funding that they can actually afford to give discounts while the other new companies cannot. They also have ensured that when you buy new mobile phone, new laptops, they come with some pre-installed apps. These days, when you buy a new mobile phone, you will see a lot of apps are pre-installed. That is not for your benefit. That is because a mobile phone company has actually taken money from those companies to pre-install these apps in your phone. So that even if you don't install them, they are already in your phone. All these things have to be looked into by the Competition Commission of India. Now, what is the problem with these big tech companies? See, our life has become so digital that a large amount of our personal data is now with these companies. Amazon, Flipkart, they all have your financial details saved. Google, Meta, Twitter, Instagram, all these actually have a lot of your personal data. Now, that gives them a lot of power. They also know the location of your phone, even your medical history, where you are going. For example, every month, every year, you will see Google will send you an email that this year you visited these many places, these many cities. So all your location is being tracked by Google, which is not really in the best interest of your privacy. This data is very, very, very expensive and it is sold at a very high price in the international market. 
these companies because they are not taking any money from you because the google search is free for you because facebook is free for you because instagram is free for you they're actually earning money by selling this data of yours to the advertisers this is where it becomes problematic the competition commission act of india of 2000 is now being amended in order to tackle these issues just like the eu has also introduced the digital markets act india in this winter session of the parliament is trying to bring changes to the law to tackle these kind of problems now let me give you an example of what exactly is the government trying to change in the law how the law will become even more stringent first the deal value threshold so now the law says that if any deal in between these companies is over 2000 crore rupees and these companies have they have substantial business operations in india then it has to be first informed to the competition commission of india without the competition commission of india's permission any deal of over 2000 crore rupees cannot be finalized then what is the time limit within which the competition commission of india will give the permission that time limit has now been set to 150 days earlier it was 210 days now if any two entities want to combine especially because when two companies combine there is a good chance of monopoly being set up in the market that permission earlier was given under 210 days now within 150 days the cci will give the permission third there's a penalty for gun jumping what is gun jumping gun jumping means the same thing again if you go ahead with combining your co two companies without the permission of cci or notification being issued by the cci if you don't fulfill point number one or point number two then the penalty will be called gun jumping that is you jump the gun you did it before the permission was given this will impose a penalty on you even earlier there was a penalty the earlier penalty was one percent of the assets or turnover of the company now the penalty will be one percent of the deal value so if the deal is of five thousand crore rupees and one percent of that will be the punishment that you will be given then hub and spoke cartels it aims to widen the scope of anti-competition agreement so basically hub and spoke cartels means what happens is if you realize amazon flipkart all of them have also released their own products so amazon for example flipkart for example they sell their own earphones speakers keyboards mouse etc they have a lot of data how much do people want to pay for a good speaker what are the good features that people prefer and then using all that information they actually make their own brands this becomes hub and spoke cartels where amazon flipkart when you search for speaker would actually give their search result or their company as a first search result this creates a problem this also creates a situation where other companies are actually pushed down the rank this is also something that will be covered under the law punishment will be given for this as well the next article that we have here is about an ongoing issue friction between the judiciary and the government as you know the collegium system has been at the center of debate in the past few months a lot of statements have been made from both the sides law minister from the side of the government that is Kiran Rijiju has made multiple statements he first said that the supreme court is busy in the collegium system while they should have been at the same time resolving the pending cases then he also said that he is worried about why is it that the supreme court's collegium system is not being changed he said that he was in fear of the njac even the vice president of india has entered the debate the vice president in his first session of the Rajya Sabha recently said that the Supreme Court striking down the NJAC was a strike to the parliamentary sovereignty which should not have happened and he was surprised that parliament did not say anything about that the Chief Justice of India on the other hand has repeatedly said that the collegium system is perfect even the other judges of the Supreme Court have blamed the government actually for delaying the collegium recommendations they are saying that the vacancy in the Supreme Court and High Court is because the government is delaying the collegium's recommendation and they keep on sending them back without any reason. This debate does not seem to be ending anytime soon. In this debate, there is one more topic that has come in the news, which is called Memorandum of Procedure. Memorandum of Procedure is nothing but a set of rules that the government and the judiciary have agreed to for the appointment of the judges in the higher judiciary. They came up as a result of the three judges' cases. This memorandum of procedure says that for appointment of a Supreme Court judge, 
the chief justice of india will be the one who will start the proceedings at the collegium system while for high court judges the memorandum of procedure says chief justice of that high court will first have his own collegium meeting and at the high court level the procedure must start 6 months before the vacancies actually arrive so you know at the high court level the judges retire at the age of 62 years so when the judges are about to retire 6 months prior to that at the high court level the proceedings should start the chief justice of the high court should start the process of recommending a new judge here and sending the name to the government and then to the supreme court collegium the government says that this has not happened the government says that high courts are not making recommendations 6 months in advance of the vacancies not just this when the high court sends a name to the government and the government then sends it to the supreme court collegium the supreme court collegium actually does not accept about 25% of these names because of which as per the government there are many vacancies in the high court so it's mainly about shifting the blame the government is saying that the blame for high court vacancies is with the supreme court they are not accepting the recommendations which have been initiated by the chief justice of that high court on the other hand the supreme court is saying that we as a supreme court collegium have the primary duty and responsibility to decide who will be the high court judge and we can reject whatever name that we want the supreme court says that the reason why there is so much vacancy at the high court and the supreme court is because the government is delaying these appointments whenever we send the name the names are then sent back by the government without any reason whatsoever which is actually not incorrect if you actually want to know more about memorandum of procedure as i told you it's an agreement between government and the judiciary of how the procedure of appointment for supreme court and the high court judges will work in india this came up as a result of the three judges cases and it gives a step by step procedure of appointment at the supreme court and at the high court level now the main debate right now is about the appointment of high court judges because this is where there is a huge number of vacancy now this document says that recommendation of the judge in the high court would start at the high court collegium so wherever the high court is actually facing vacancies that high court chief justice will start the process the high court chief justice will send certain recommendation to the central government where the recommendation of the state government will also be asked and there will be an input taken from intelligence bureau they will do a background check then the government will forward the file with the ib input to the supreme court collegium who will take the final call this is where the government says the problem starts the government says that the supreme court collegium is not accepting most of the names and they are delaying the appointment of the high court judges supreme court collegium is within its rights to ask for additional inputs from the government's opinions they can also reject the proposal this is what their view is but the government says that the supreme court is rejecting most of the names while the supreme court says even when we accept this government is delaying the actual appointment at the end by the president of india this is where the problem lies the next article that we have here is about the role of female leadership in the government now this article is actually a very old article it was first published in september 2020 hindu newspaper has this habit they keep on republishing their old articles which they think are relevant even today so this article was published back in september 2020 so some facts in this article have changed for example this article starts by saying that nations such as germany have female leadership which is not the case right now germany does not have a female leader anymore so it was written at the time when angela merkel was a german chancellor so this article says that wherever around the world we see more women in government those governments have always performed better for example and i have changed the germany example to finland now so for example finland taiwan new zealand all have women leaders these are some of the nations that performed much much better in the pandemic as compared to other nations look at the us even in the us look at the state wise data the states that have female governors actually performed better during the covid-19 pandemic and their deaths were much lesser you can look at india as well those panchayats that have a female pradhan that have a female chairman those panchayats have actually performed much better when it comes to infrastructure and planning this study was conducted by nobel laureate esther duflo 
where she found out that those gram panchayats having the female pradhans have focused much more on rural infrastructure there have been multiple such studies conducted pointing out towards a direct connection between women in governance and good government outputs so there is no doubt that these two are interconnected to each other even then the number of women in politics in india especially are way way underrepresented female members make up only 10% of india's ministerial strength if i give you a challenge right now without googling at the top of your mind if i ask you give me the names of female cabinet ministers that are present in the modi government right now i am sure you would name mrs nirmala sitaraman smriti irani but then i am very sure that after that most of you would not be able to take the third name so this is a big 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 cause of concern i am not saying that no one would be able to know some other names i am sure many of you would know other names as well but at the top of your mind i am sure when you think of a minister there is very little chance that you think of female ministers apart from these two that are present right now then you can also think of minakshi lekhi maybe in some cases you can think of anupriya patel as well but again as i said not at the top of your mind so the number of female ministers in the country also have to be improved and made way 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 better even if you look at the chief ministers in india there is only one female chief minister right now that is from west bengal if you look at lok sabha there is 14% strength of lok sabha right now that comprise of women which is the highest ever but even then this is way way lower if you look at how the other nations in the world actually perform india ranks at 143rd out of 192 nations when it comes to women representation in the national parliament women reservation bill that is reserving 33% seats for women in the parliament has long been pending it was passed in rajya sabha in 2010 but never passed in the lok sabha and even after lok sabha it had to go to state legislature as well because it talked about representation of women at the state legislature also so this bill has all been forgotten since it was first passed in the rajya sabha the interesting part is it has been opposed by many male members as well who don't think that the bill is worth it now i wanted to give you examples of world and asia as well about the women representation in parliament now the asian numbers are a bit outdated 2017 this is the latest number i could find from world bank even in terms of asia you would see india is far far below other nations such as philippines nepal vietnam singapore even pakistan and bangladesh and when it comes to worldwide numbers rwanda that does have women reservation is right at the top you have cuba mexico nicaragua uae again a surprising country here new zealand iceland these are the nations that come way at the top the global average of 26% is almost twice as compared to what india has right now in our parliament so we need to improve it especially because studies have proven that there is a direct correlation between number of women in the government and good governance the next article that we have here is a short article on factors of production in simple terms factors of production are those resources which are the basic building block of production in any economy mainly when you talk about factors of production there are three factors that people talk about land labor and capital which is absolutely necessary for any economy whatsoever their participation or their availability or unavailability decides how an economy would grow in the long run in the past few years there is a fourth factor that is also added by many people that is called entrepreneurship or many people say this as enterprise so many people agree there are only three factors of production while others talk about four factors of production where they add the fourth one as entrepreneurship the older economists don't agree the older economists say that enterprise or entrepreneurship is a secondary factor they believe that land labor and time still remain the primary factors of production and everything else comes after that now there are different economic ideologies around the world as you know there is a capitalist ideology the marxist ideology these ideologies differ in how they want the factors of production to be controlled for example marxist ideology believes that these factors of production need to be collectively owned by the state and not by individuals so that their gains can be distributed across the entire society and not just by few people capitalist economy on the other hand free market economy practiced in us uk france etc they believe that there should be freedom amongst people to choose 
whoever wants to own the factors of production should be allowed to own it whoever wants to gain profit out of it should be allowed to gain profit that is how the different economies are divided socialist economy believes that government should control these factors of production while a capitalist economy believes that private sector should control these factors of production as you can see here land labor capital have always been the three parts or three building blocks of the factors of production while enterprise or entrepreneurship has come in in a much more later version of economies around the world these are the important articles you want to discuss from the hindu newspaper today now a couple of practice questions number 1 how is public health different from public sector health care what are the lacuna in india's public health setup second what are the new way challenges posed by big tech in today's times is a indian law adequately framed to handle such challenges both the questions have to be answered within 250 words each also make sure that you use the byju's exam prep apps student answer writing portal to put in your answers there you can see each other's answers give feedback to each other and learn from each other's mistakes the link to that portal also is given in the description of the video thank you so much for watching have a good day ahead